We are live, Keisha. Great, hello everyone. Um, let's see, maybe let's give it another 10 seconds, 10, 15 seconds or so for a few more attendees to join. All right, awesome, I'll get started. Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this media briefing during which we shall discuss uh, the fifth United Nations Environment Assembly and uh, the UN Environment Programme's new medium term strategy. My name is Keisha Rukikaire, I head up the news and media unit at uh, UNEP and I will be moderating this virtual press briefing. Um, as many of you will know, the UN Environment Assembly takes place biennially here in uh, Nairobi at UN UNEP HQ. Um, now, due to the, uh, the impact of the pandemic, this year's is kind of unique. We have uh, the assembly split in two halves. The first is virtual, taking place over the past two days. Um, and the second, which we hope will be in person, will take place in February 2022. Now, despite being virtual, um, this unit has managed to take care of some important business from the launch of uh, key reports in the run up to the assembly to some strong and engaging submissions during the leadership dialogue and uh, of course the adoption of key elements of UNEP's work. Now, before we get into the subject matter of the day, I'd like to explain a few housekeeping rules. Uh, the program is 40 minutes long and we hope to use half that time for media Q and A. On today's small uh, but distinguished panel is His Excellency Mr. Sveinung Rutevatn, President of UNEA 5 and Minister of Climate and Environment for Norway and Ms. Inga Anderson, Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program. So for media with questions, and you'll see a Q&A option in your Zoom screen, please use that Q&A box to submit your questions. You can start right away to submit them, as many of you will have been following the UNEA 5 proceedings and may already have some questions teed up. When you do submit them, please specify your name and the media outlet that you represent. The session is being recorded and live streamed. The recording and live stream can both be accessed through our website, unep.org and, UN and our YouTube channel, um, as can be the rest of the UNEF 5 materials and the medium term strategy. My contact information is available on our website. We can also put it in the chat box here as well. If you'd like interviews, uh, please let us know. So uh, without further ado, um, let's go straight to remarks from Mr. Rutabatten. Thanks, uh, Keisha. I'm uh, very happy to be here and happy to uh, say a few words uh, here at the start. Uh, yesterday, I had the honor uh, to open the 5th UN Environment Assembly um, for the first time ever in a virtual format. And like everyone else, we, of course, uh, have had to adapt to the unprecedented situation. Uh, the fact that 151 countries are registered and connected online along with civil society, of course, and other stakeholders, braving time zones, braving technical difficulties. It shows just how important we all think it is to meet, to discuss our common work for the environment. Now, we recently concluded the last leadership dialogue uh, in which environment ministers and experts discussed the contribution of the environmental dimension of sustainable development. Uh, and how this helps build a resilient and inclusive post-pandemic world. Everyone gathered at the Environment Assembly today are deeply concerned about how the pandemic causes new and serious health, socioeconomic and environmental challenges, and how it exacerbates existing ones all over the world. Development gains have been set back undermining our common efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals. Many colleagues are deeply concerned by the continuing loss of biodiversity and the degradation and fragmentation of ecosystems and habitats for wildlife. This, in addition to the threats from climate change and from the pollution and waste crisis. We will face recurring risks of pandemics in the future if we maintain our current unsustainable patterns in our interactions with nature. 
I believe we have, during this time of crisis, rediscovered just how much our health and well-being depends upon nature and the solutions that nature provides. So one important task is to discuss how we, as environment ministers, can contribute, contribute to a better recovery from the pandemic that benefits both people and nature. In this context, I am pleased to say that yesterday, the Fifth UN Environment Assembly agreed on three decisions. We did this specifically to make sure that our work for the environment continues, that we will convene again in 2022, and that as we emerge from the pandemic, UNEP and UNEA will be prepared to play their important role. Importantly, we adopted the UNEP's medium term strategy. That may sound a bit mundane, but in fact, it will ensure that UNEP is well placed to help us as UN member states and all relevant actors to respond to the environmental crisis we are facing. That we are all meeting here this week to adopt this strategy is a testament to the importance of a high functioning and effective UN environment program. We also decided to celebrate UNEP at 50 in 2022, when it will be 50 years since its establishment at the Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment. This will allow us both to celebrate the achievements of those 50 years, but also to learn from that experience so that we are even better equipped to face the future. I'm also happy that Africa, as host to UNEP, will have a strong role in that celebration. When the fifth UN Environment Assembly resumes next year, it will be with a much fuller and richer agenda with a range of important issues that warrant urgent attention. The theme for UNEA 5 is strengthening actions for nature to achieve sustainable development goals. And this is precisely what I hope and expect that the assembly will do. We shall work together to identify actions which can help us address climate change, protect biodiversity, and reduce pollution, all at the same time. The broad mandate of UNEP allows us uniquely to seek holistic solutions across different environmental problems. We must step up the action to truly transform our relationship with our planet. We're in this together, and we must respond together, each doing our part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rutavatl. Uh, handing over the floor now to Ms. Anderson for brief remarks as well. Thank you, Keisha, and, and a warm thanks to Minister Rotavatan who has been extraordinary in his leadership of this uh, unique, as he rightly says, uh, environment assembly. Look, if anyone needs a reminder why the planet is in trouble, I think our report that we issued, uh, or actually that the Secretary General issued last week, making peace with nature, gave the full detail of the challenges that we're facing. This report really did bring home the full scale of the planetary emergency. If we do not take action, future generations will stand to uh, inherit a hothouse planet with more carbon in the atmosphere than in the last 800,000 years and still rising. Future generations would see sinking cities from Basra to Lagos, from Mumbai to Houston. The economy has grown, the global economy has, but the world's stock of natural assets has fallen and future generations would not see the wonders of a big rhino or other exotic or unique species and would see uh, enough toxic waste, which would fill 125,000 sw Olympic swimming pools per year. So simply put, and as we also heard from minister, our patterns of consumption and production are unsustainable to sustain the very foundations of life on earth. 
So I won't repeat all that is in the report because they've been widely reported, but our task these two days has, bring, has been to bring together every country, every business, every investor, every civil society voice, every organization, and yes, every citizen from young to old to implement and to be aware and then help implement solutions as a matter of urgency. And I am encouraged by the fact that we held the United Nations Environment Assembly. This was not given. It took courage by ministers because we understand that there is a digital divide and yet all agreed that this was the way to go. And I, extremely, I am extremely thankful to member states for approving the medium term strategy, which may sound rather technocratic, but which actually sets the guardrails for environmental action for the next period of time through 2025. The strategy provides is about providing science and know-how to governments. The strategy is about the rule of law. The strategy is about transforming the sectors that are having an impact on our environment. The strategy is about ensuring that we reach out and include citizens and, and civil society. It's about leveraging digital technology but it is also about tackling environmental unsustainability because by doing that, we tackle poverty. The strategy is also about reorganizing and transforming how we at UNEP work so that we can be faster uh, uh, in support of member states and all of society, stronger and work harder. So it is about a collective all of society action. It is about moving us outside the ministries of environment to drive that action. And the last few days have been truly encouraging in this regard. We've seen a global effort on resource efficient circular economy, a push for financing, reduction emissions from forests, governments and scientists and businesses coming together to look for big data as a tool for change, youth raising their voices and saying, nothing about us without us and calling for targeted funds to enable their deeper engagement. All of this is great, but we need to start putting words into action after UNEA 5. And that means backing a green recovery from the pandemic. That means stronger national determined contributions to the Paris Agreement and more funding for adaptation. That means agreeing on an ambitious and implementable uh, by post-2020 biodiversity framework. And that means a new chemical management framework and renew progress on plastic pollution. Rapid efforts to renew nature during the UN decade on ecosystem restoration is part of this too. And in this regard, I want to thank Pakistan for its kind offer, which we have accepted, uh, of hosting this year's World Environment Day, which uh, will be, uh, uh, I expect people will know, takes place the 5th of June. Uh, and, uh, and this is when we will officially launch the decade for ecosystem restoration. 2021 can be the year when we make peace with nature. It's up to us to make it happen. And UNIA was a big step in this direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Anderson and uh, Mr. Rutavadan. Uh, with that, we'll go straight to questions. Uh, we already have one, uh, which I think perhaps both of you might have views on. This question is from Steve uh, Tolikin, media outlet is business magazine, Plastics News in the US. And the question is, what actions did UNEA 5 take regarding the potential global plastics treaty? Would that treaty be finalized by the in-person UNEA in 2022? What would the potential treaty require nations to do? Um, perhaps, uh, Mr. Rutavadan, you can, you can start. Sure. Uh, well, thanks for a great question. Uh, as many of you will know, Maureen Litter uh, has been on the agenda of the uh, Environment Assembly since uh, uh, the meeting in 2014 actually and you know resolutions have been uh, taken at every assembly uh, and the urgency of UNEA to act on this has been highlighted at a broad range of political meetings and we have agreed to the uh, long-term elimination of all discharge of marine litter and microplastics uh, to the oceans. Now the uh, ad hoc open-ended expert group on marine litter and microplastics uh, also has unanimously called for member states and stakeholders to recognize the magnitude and urgency of this issue and to seriously consider the identified options and work cooperatively toward UNEA 5. Uh, now, uh, 
as you know, in this uh, part one of Unia 5, um, uh, which is digital, uh, it's, it's difficult to have real negotiations between countries uh, on, on, on subjects uh, where you want to make you know, substantial changes uh, to policy and agreements. Uh, so uh, there is an agreement between uh, between all the participants that it is at UNEA 5 Part 2, uh, where we will go deeper into actual negotiations on several issues. And I expect that uh, to happen as well when it comes to progress on, on the plastics and marine litter side. Uh, and uh, I guess I should also say that, you know, during uh, the last uh, year or a couple of years, actually, there has certainly been a strong momentum building, a lot of nations joining calls to to agree on a uh, on a binding agreement and a lot of countries are taking steps on their own uh, but i think uh, we'll have to await uh, part two of unl5 before we get into negotiations between uh, member states and we'll see where that leads great thank you very much mr minister um uh, anderson well, thank you um and i will just pick up where minister left off because i'm obviously very encouraged by the work of the ad hoc uh, expert group uh, that has been working through this period. One thing is clear, status quo is not an option. Uh, we, and that's why the issue around circularity is so important. This take, make and discards just doesn't work anymore. We can't take out of the environment, produce something, put it into the economy. And when we're done with it, we discard it back into the environment. Circularity has to be part and parcel of the story here. And it will require all hands on deck from science to private sector to government regulators and of course, civil society. Now, it's an interesting thing that already um, one continent has done a lot of work on this. And I just want to highlight Africa and what Africa has done. 34 nations out of 54 have already uh, instituted some kind of plastic bag ban or other plastic ban. That doesn't substitute for what your question is about, but it is worth celebrating that the African continent has put their hat, uh, hand up and said, we are taking action and taking action progressively in this way. Another point just to augment to what Minister was saying is that there are two existing conventions, a Basel Convention that deals with the transport of hazardous waste across borders. Basel Convention has 185 parties as, as signatories. The annex to that convention, which was negotiated in the last COP, went into effect January 1 and, and bans a large number of plastics from being uh, transported and exported, um, uh, which is very good because as we heard the Australian minister speak to in her statement just now in the dialogue, the, the uh, and many others have spoken, but I quote her as saying that indeed um, the waste that is produced should also be then handled and not exported elsewhere. Um, and finally, I should mention the Stockholm Convention that deals with persistent organic pollutants. That convention has 184 parties, and here Stockholm parties took Stockholm has has started to consider the additives in plastic. Um, where these form a persistent organic pollutants, because we know that these pops, the persistent organic pollutants, end in our food, end in our species, and therefore in us, and, and end in wildlife. And we have found, for example, one chemical additive, the UV328 additive, which inhibits a sun degradation already now is found in the Arctic. So we know that the long range, um, travel of degrading plastic is very serious. Bottom line, action is needed. Some action is being taken within existing uh, instruments and we celebrate that. And meanwhile, the next junior will take a hard look at and look at uh, what to do on a broader level. And I, for one, I'm quite encouraged with, where, with the journey that we have taken so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Anderson. Just a, a quick follow-up to that question from uh, Julia Forster from the German Press Agency. Um, at part two of UNEA in 2022, do you expect the assembly to pass a mandate to negotiate a plastics treaty, a global plastics treaty? Perhaps Mr. Minister, you could go first. 
well, what to expect? Uh, well, we, we, we'll see uh, how, uh, how expectations build in the next year and uh, where the agenda is going. Uh, I mean, speaking as, as a Norwegian environment minister, uh, I would certainly be in favor of that. And uh, I know a lot of countries are pushing for that to happen. But as you know, and, uh, at UNEA, we take decisions together uh, and uh, we'll see um, what the appetite is when we get into part two. But uh, uh, but this illustrates that, you know, um, uh, taking a, a, say, a significant step as that uh, would require negotiations between countries and we'll have to to, to find agreements. And, and that's uh, challenging to do digitally, uh, but hopefully uh, we'll be able to make substantial progress on a range of issues when we meet physically, hopefully, in a year or so. Uh, but uh, it's a good question. And a lot of countries have that on their agenda. Uh, and we'll see where UNEA 5 Part 2 lands. Great. Uh, Ms. Anderson, you'd like to add something? Maybe just to say that it's not a sort of either or uh, situation because um, what we've seen, and it's probably just to add to the global agenda of conversation, is that protocols are often a little bit easier than full-fledged conventions. And so one should look at, as we are still exploring here and as we don't know where it will land, look at where other elements have landed. And the Kigali Protocol is a very interesting example. It didn't involve renegotiating full treaty because that's complex. So, but it still holds uh, member states who have signed up to its feet to the fire. So I think it's, it's, we're gonna look at where, as minister said, uh, it lands. What is clear is the status quo is not an option. What is clear is we need global action. And what is clear is we know that uh, global regulatory settings of this nature uh, tends to uh, turn the attention to the problem at hand. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, an, another question here from Pedro Alonso from uh, the Spanish news agency FA. Two questions for both panelists. Number one, what is the main outcome of the virtual session of UNEA 5? Um, I, I think that that perhaps has been answered, but perhaps you can just, uh, just go over it again. And what message is uh, UNEA 5 sending for the forthcoming COP26 in terms of goals to be achieved at that important conference? Uh, Minister Rotebarton, perhaps you can start. Sure. Well, uh, there are several outcomes uh, from this UNEA. Uh, we've mentioned a few of them. The medium term strategy is important. The passing of the budget uh, is important. Uh, making sure that we can celebrate you in about 50 uh, is an important decision. Um, today, we will be uh, discussing a, a political message uh, that, uh, that I have uh, put forward, uh, which I hope will be adopted uh, by the assembly and which uh, there have been uh, quite a few discussions uh, regarding that over the past few months. But uh, I'm very happy that uh, the uh, open-ended committee of the CPR took note with appreciation of my intention to present the message. Uh, and we'll see how that goes, goes today. Um, now, the second question um, on COP26 uh, uh, is a good one because I think, uh, you know, uh, we've been suffering on the, this pandemic for, for over a year now. Uh, there have been so many important uh, summits and meetings that have been postponed, including uh, the COP26, including the uh, biodiversity meeting in Kunming, China. Uh, and I think just uh, setting up this UNEA 5 now and actually doing the meeting uh, and you know, looking forward is important to uh, move into these other uh, meetings over the next year or so. Uh, at full speed uh, and with countries willing to talk to each other, to meet. Uh, and obviously the important thing at the COP26, uh, well, one of several, but in my opinion, the most important thing is to get countries to uh, commit to, um, to higher ambitions, to enhance their NDCs. Uh, a lot of major economies have done so, uh, some still haven't. And hopefully uh, a successful UNEA 5 part one now will inspire uh, countries uh, to move forward uh, with, uh, with, with, with their ambitions uh, and to uh, build back better from the pandemic and, uh, and invest in green solutions rather in, than in yesterday's solutions. Indeed, green solutions. Um, uh, Inge, would you like to add, add something? Maybe just a couple of words. I mean, um, we heard from Minister very much what, what uh, 
what we are looking to see, I mean, the, the, the medium term strategy of UNEP highlights these, that we're gonna work on these three planetary crises, the climate crisis, the nature and biodiversity crisis and the pollution and waste crisis on the climate crisis. Obviously the goals are set within the context of the UNFCCC and of the Paris Accord. But at the same time, we need to understand that the Paris Accord asks countries to stretch every five years, right? It's through these to be submitted nationally determined contribution. The first crop of these were submitted directly into Paris in 2015. They were prepared in a rush and they didn't have the depth. Now we should have been in 2020, they're coming in 2021. But this next crop of NDCs, National Determined Contributions, has to stretch. It has to stretch. Because if we do nothing, if we do nothing, we are going to hit three and a half degrees by 2100. If we do what we promised in Paris, the unconditional NDCs will reach three degrees. If we do what we've said in the net zero club, which now has 126 countries that have signed up, we will reach 2.6 degrees. And I'm here including the US, although they haven't signed up yet, but in the Biden plan, they, the Biden election platform, they said they would. So that means that even with the net zero commitments, we are not where we need to be. And that means that we need to stretch even further. We are already at 1.1, 1.2 degrees average increase. So we have about 0.4 left, which also means that making a net zero commitment in 2050, I mean, by 2050, does not mean you kick the can down the road. It means we start in 2021. So what we would like to see in these NDCs is actual actionable um, uh, actions already implemented and on the way towards implementation. On COVID, Minister said it very well. Um, indeed, we, are, we put $13 trillion into the global economy to restart the economy, to protect people and to support health system. That was wise. And obviously the first thing has to be to protect, to protect uh, uh, health and, 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 and society's health systems. Next, to put money into people's pockets, but thereafter, the money that is going into the economy, let that not go into a gray economy, let that go into a green economy. That is what many countries have been doing and it will offer new jobs. It will offer a leap into a greener economy. So that's very much what we are also pushing for at UNEP. Thank you very much, Ms. Anderson. Um, now, speaking of COVID, we have a question from uh, Roma Dekajevi from Radio Topka in Benin, who says, we all know that COVID-19 has weakened some built resiliences on the African continent. What uh, has UNEP uh, UNEA 5 decided, how has UNEA, UNEA 5 decided to strengthen the food security, for instance, in some African countries? I imagine uh, this would be food security linked to the impact of the pandemic. Um, I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Ms. Anderson, first. Maybe I'll start. I mean, obviously we are UNEP, so we do work on environment, but our colleagues in FAO, in IFAD, and in WFP in the United Nations system, they carry more of the front line responsibility on dealing with food security, notwithstanding the fact that we're working closely in support of them. Uh, the Secretary General has called for a World Food Summit uh, that should be held uh, in 2021 on the sidelines of uh, United Nations General Assembly. And this summit is an all of society approach. Again, it's not just for the food agencies, WFP, IFAD and FAO, it is for everyone and every government to see precisely how one can move towards food security. What I would say is that one of UNEP's strong dimensions deal obviously with supporting uh, restoration of degraded ecosystems. And here in the African context, the green um, the the uh, the green greening of Africa, the Great Green Wall initiative by some 22 or plus more countries from Senegal in in one end through Somalia on the other. That initiative is one where we are working very much in accord with the Convention on Desertification, with the African Development Bank, and with many others to support countries as they seek to reclaim 
what has been lost in part through climate change, in part through uh, over exploitation. And we see that frankly also as a dimension of stabilization in some countries that have also gone through or are going through internal turmoil. Let me stop here. Thank you. Uh, Minister, would you like to add anything? Well, just a quick remark. Uh, as the executive director said, uh, you know, food security is, is, is more at the center of uh, of the mandate of, of other uh, UN organizations. But but let me remind remind you uh, you all that what the theme for UNEA five actually is, which is of course strengthening actions for nature to achieve the sustainable development goals. Uh, and uh, I mentioned this because uh, sometimes uh, you know uh, actions for nature uh, are put up against development, including food security. Uh, but I think it's quite the opposite, that uh, sustainable food systems and sound nature management go, go hand in hand. And uh, we need to uh, ramp up our actions for nature uh, because nature is important in and of itself. But uh, a healthy environment is also important for food security and to make sure that you can reach all of the sustainable development goals. So uh, I think it's a, a good question. Uh, and there's a lot of work to be done on food security from, from many, many actors here. Uh, but strengthening actions for nature is also something that is important to make sure that we all can have access to safe food systems and sustainable food systems. Thank you very much. Uh, now, we, I think we have time for just one or two more questions. Uh, we have one from Yan Zhe Li, uh, New York University College of Arts and Science, who says, what expectations does UNEA have for the upcoming UN Biodiversity Conference in Kunming, China? Uh, I'll start with you again, Ms. Anderson. Thank you. Uh, UNEA did not express itself uniquely, but Mr. Minister will clearly speak to that. What I will speak to is more broadly what UNEP is, is holding for. We have, of course, already agreed uh, back in 2010 on some quite ambitious goals, uh, which we were supposed to have been delivering by 2020. We have not. We have come up short as a, as a global community. None of the 20 goals look likely to be met. So that's not a good situation. Now, what we would like to see is clearly, and I have gone on record on this, uh, uh, no net loss. Now, let's recall that the 2010 plan called for no loss of biodiversity by 2020, and that we would have stabilized the systems by then. So uh, at this point, uh, the 2010 goals have been somewhat criticized that they were not measurable enough and so um, that they were not precise enough. We know more now. We know that there are three dimensions to biodiversity. There's species diversity, there's ecosystem diversity, and there's genetic diversity. And we need to be mindful of all three because just looking after the ecosystem or just looking after the species or the genetic doesn't do the, do the trick. And back to the food security question, if, uh, what is it? I forget the number, but some extraordinary amount of our food, our staples come from just 13 species. That's not a good plan for the future. So species diversity and genetic diversity, even in our rice and our potatoes and our apples matter. So getting that diversity is, is important. So I hope very much that we will get ambitious plans, but not just plans, that we will have this commensurate with funding and with willingness to implement. And that does mean that it is not just the environment ministers who agree, because loss is happening because of over-exploitation, loss is happening because of fragmentation, and loss is happening because of, of other drivers such as climate change. So um, that's where we need to get to getting clearer what we measure, getting clearer about the commitments. And frankly, like we are doing in, um, in climate change where we take stock every five years, maybe that's not a bad idea, but we'll see where the negotiators land. Thank you, uh, Mr. Minister. Well, as, uh, as environment minister, I obviously have a, uh, a lot of strong opinions about uh, how I want the the um, the Kunming meeting to go uh, in China uh, this this uh, this uh, fall. Um, but but I'll, I'll as you know, five president, I think I'll just limit myself to say that um, I think, uh, as I mentioned in my previous response, 
uh, just successfully holding this meeting uh, at this time of crisis is important in and of itself because it shows that environmental diplomacy still works countries are willing to come together countries are willing to agree on important issues and when we have so many important summits and meetings coming up uh, including the Kunming meeting including the COP26 in, in Glasgow uh, this is important uh, because we need a will from countries to, to compromise, uh, to find solutions. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, when we hopefully have successfully finished this part one of uh, UNEA 5 and have adopted several decisions, and hopefully also an endorsement of a political message, that will send a clear signal uh, to the world uh, that even in the midst of a global pandemic, uh, where we obviously have to deal with that, we also have to deal with our long-term crises. And our long-term crises, the loss of nature, climate change, pollution, are still as, uh, as difficult, still as important, still as critical to find solutions to as they were before the pandemic. So um, I'm looking forward to the meeting in, in China. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to land important decisions there. Hopefully we'll be able to meet this fall. Uh, and I think UNEF5 is a good start to this very important year of uh, many important decisions to be made, hopefully, at a global level. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, that's all the time we have uh, for now. Thank you very much, Ms. Minister Rutavadan, and thank you very much, Ms. Anderson, for joining us. And to our media colleagues, apologies for those we couldn't respond to immediately. We shall uh, make an effort to send you responses via email. Um, thanks very much for your time and attention. As always, we will be issuing a press release at the closing of UNEA, summarizing the uh, discussions and events and the outcomes. So please uh, be on the lookout for that. And of course, as, again, if you have questions, we are always available. Thanks very much and have a good afternoon.